Welcome to the Spinner Rack with your hosts, Brian and Junior. Welcome to issue 14 of the Spinner Rack. This week we'll be talking about toy scalping, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Joining me as always is my co-host. What's up guys, Junior? And our special guest. Jonathan Paparella, Johnny Freeze. And our extra special guest. Yes, I'm extra special. <laughs> it's Kerry the Camera Guy, or CC, whichever is easier for you to remember. And on the phone today, my buddy from Detroit, Mrs. Mr. Dennis Mrs. Barger. Wow. Eh, whatever. Right. <laughs> Dennis! <laughs> What's up, guys? How you doing, sir? I'm just glad you didn't introduce me as your, your special head guest. Well, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe next time. <laughs> All right, so Dennis, do us a favor, man. Give the listeners a quick rundown about who you are and what you do. Oh, I am kind of the uh, the poster child for toy scalpers. In 1996, a uh, Wall Street Journal reporter got wind of toy scalping, and he threw a couple people that knew me found out. for you because I was uh, talking with some of the guys here and you and me are the same age and uh, Brian's uh, our generation. When did this all really sort of begin? Because I was saying as a kid I still remember being able to go to a toy and whether it was a Mego figure or whether it was Mego, Mego uh, Star Wars figure. I mean I never had a problem pulling anything off the rack. It was always there. When did this, st- this scalping occur? When did the, either a shortage occur or this this uh, scalping begin because I honestly don't know where it started. We uh, I'm actually done a lot of research. First of all, let me uh, well, let me at least call Brian. It's not a Mego, it's Mego. Because a, I'm a personal friend of Marty Abrams <laughs> and the entire company was named after Marty telling his dad when they went to the office of the uh, original Abrams toy company. Sure. Mego too, Mego too. <laughs> Told so you when yes. they rebranded the company with a new name, they rebranded it Mego. Uh, yeah, just so you know, that was Junior that said <laughs> Mego. Oh, yeah, sorry. Was, you, I, you screwed the boss. <laughs> All right. Well, well I always, you know, I figured it was. For the toy I figured it was. It was. Uh, I've always said it was me, uh, Mego because it says, you know what? It's not pronounced Legos. They're Lego blocks. So it's like all they did was replace the letter. That's Germans. Okay. Jewish, so there's no way you would have that. All right. Well, now I know. Now I know. So back to the main question. When did this? So back to it. We've actually done a lot of research on this, and we've. I know so many toy lines. There was no need to scout back then because you had so many mom and pop toy stores. Now there was really scalping to some extent because if you remember back in the seventies and early eighties, before the huge expansion of the toy departments and department stores, and the 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 all in one children's palace, toy palace, that kind of. Three sixty nine venture price, baby, all day. Oh, three sixty nine. Three sixty nine. Okay, well, I worked at Ventures in high school in nineteen eighty eight, and I remember the first case of turtles. I opened the first case of turtles and bought all four, and I had them mounted to the dashboard of my first car. But that was one of the hardest toys to find. If you remember three sixty nine, you know three hundred sixty nine cents. You remember Leonardo was impossible to find. 
So what? So once again, does this go back to maybe a manufacturing thing, or is this, or is this just people once again just buying and buying and buying, which made it harder to find? Because like you said, there was, there was a point I think in manufacturing where they said we can't just sell the four kernels. They had already started branding out and doing so many different Batman at that time. If you remember, but I, no, that was that was in the early nineties. I'm sorry, I think that's that. Um, eighty-eight. Playmates rolled up and they wanted to do every turtle. Well, if you remember, when they would make those case assortments of those first turtle waves, you had to have the foot soldier, uh, shredder, and uh, splitter in that first case assortment. Well, nobody cared about those guys. They wanted the turtles. You know, in the original comic book, Splitter's dead in, I forget what issue, but he, he's dead in the third or fourth issue. Right, so so what? So you so, so they just didn't make it. was the first kind of cross pollination that all the comic book fans who just wanted the four turtles. Then you had all the kids who wanted the four turtles, but then they wanted to put in all these other characters that were from the cartoon series. Hmm. So that caused a demand, a double demand on the turtles, which then caused a reason for you to go out if you wanted to sell to your customer base like a comic book shop, you would go out and buy the turtles. So, so now the question comes back to with, say, starting with the turtles, and then now what we have today. What? Why won't these manufacturers seem to make more of these things? If they, I mean, you can obviously check the market and see what's selling and what's not. It seems counterproductive to make like one per case or two per case, as opposed to hey, this one's selling. Why not make more? As opposed to letting, for example, the scalpers or somebody else grab the single one drive up the price and make the profit themselves as opposed to the companies keeping the profits since they already have the molds and making more of the one that's that selling. Well, if you watch the, if you guys put a link on your uh, site to that uh, Marketplace interview I did, I actually called the manufacturers out on that. I said, look, you know, clearly if you guys did any research whatsoever at Hasbro on that Beast War show, you would have seen that every kid loved Cheetor. Why would Cheetor not be produced for to a case as compared to one of the lesser characters like Rat Trap. None of the kids like Rat Trap. I remember seeing hangers look full of Rat Traps at every store we went to. Well, they need to do the market research. They need to sit 10 kids down in a room and say, which one of these kids, which one of these characters is your favorite after watching the pilot episode? They could easily be doing this. And then if they pay attention to the market, send out people to check, you know, out marketing surveys to the stores that said, hey, which character seems to be selling the fastest? You know what? Wave two, let's produce some more cheaters. Wave three, you know what? We're still selling the cheaters. Produce some more cheaters. Right. No, we don't need any more Rhinoxes or Rat Traps. Those are hanging on the shelves. Totally. So is they it- don't want to do that work. That's an extra hair of work. They just feel like, hey, we sold out of our, we sold out of the case assortment. We're done. Doesn't matter if Toys R Us is sitting on 15 you know, copies of this one figure, which equals the case that they can't sell, you know, we sold it. It's good. It's out of our hands. We don't have to worry about it. So it's basically laziness on part of the manufacturers is part of the problem. It is. It is. Laziness and not forward thinking. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so basically, like, we've done our yeah. one run, and that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, one and done. Yeah, exactly. Now, then it's... Uh, Go ahead. The turtles was the first minor incident where these were happening. That was just a simple turn and burn. People were buying them for five, selling them for ten. You know, that was common in the comic book industry. Um, the biggest time when this hit was the Star Trek line. The Playmate Star Trek line. What year was that, 94? That one I'm not familiar with. The Playmate X Generation? Yeah, the Playmates line. The Playmates line was 94, I believe. Yeah. Yep. There was there were several lines that were decent prior to that, but that was the line where they literally said, "Let's make the entire bridge crew two to a case. Let's put one Borg in the case. Let's let's short the Borg." And that's where they started short packing a figure. Now they did it because they didn't think these things were going to be popular. You know, particular figures. They figured everybody was just going to want the bridge crew. And as long as we have three or four waves of the bridge crew and different uniform changes, everyone's going to be happy. And they would, oh, here's an alien, throw that in there. They didn't follow their history. The aliens were always the most popular. Even at that point, the Star Trek Nico aliens, Nico, 
go. I'm going to rub that in. Um, the Star Trek Nico aliens were short packed because they didn't think anyone was going to care, and they were still collectible, even at that 94 point in time. Those are the ones everybody wanted to have. The Golub stuff from 88, the, the aliens were short packed, and they were the hard to find ones. And they were still going collectively six years later at a higher premium price, where you could find every one of them. Every single other one of them is still hanging on shelves, actually. When the Playmates came out, we went up to Canada, and you could find the little Star Trek sitting right next to the uh, Playmates Star Treks. Now let's so, get... you know, that's where the company started saying, let's minimize our losses and not put something, you know, hanging on the shelf. Let's short pack this thing we think is going to be the, the you know, the one that nobody's going to want. And, so, and it was the board. It was the most popular that you could have possibly created. Now, did they did they ever go back and make more of them? Because, like I said, I don't remember a shortage of Star Trek figures. I mean, maybe that was after the fact. But did they ever... Well, actually, you're, you're absolutely correct. Okay. Uh, the board was put into heavy rotation. Now, this was one of the smart things Playmates did. They realized the collectability of these action figures, but they serial numbered all of them. Now, we cataloged the serial numbers while we were going on our hunting expeditions for figures. And we realized that the serial numbers were actually still going up incrementally on every one of these waves, so we actually noticed at one point, I want to see 300,000 of the board, the regular standard board figure, and they had variations on this package with a paw, that, that scope of the board is well over 300,000 units being produced of it. So they did keep that in the consistent circulation. So, so once again, it, that it, they they really solved the problem, and basically the people that really, unless they wanted first ones, the guys who really got screwed over in that were the guys that were already uh, scalping that or paying scalp prices, correct? Because they reissued. Them. Right. Well, in a lot of ways, you're absolutely correct. The people who are not patient, see that, and that's where we get to with the scalping argument. There are there's an entire segment of people out there who do not care about scalping, and I want to I want to get into this. People who are patient and wait, and they don't have to have all nine figures of an assortment, they can settle for having eight figures of an assortment and then wait a year, and then, oh, I just happened to find the ninth figure at a store that I just happened to randomly stop shop at, or I found it for, you know, a dealer that was something, you know, his overstock that he couldn't sell back at his, self, you know, his buy price. The people who want scalping are the people who don't have time to waste. And this is what the argument I try to, to tell people in the scalping debate. There's a mom and a dad, and they both work 40-hour days. And they both get home between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock at night. And at 6 o'clock at night, they want to eat dinner. Now it's 7 o'clock. They've had their family time. They've had their dinner with this kid. And they've heard that kid complain that they want that one toy. Or maybe the dad's the collector and he wants that one toy. They both worked 80 hours that week. They don't want to spend their weekend, Saturday and Sunday, going from Toys R Us to Target to Walmart, trying to find an action figure. On top of that, they don't want to waste, that, you know, nineteen ninety two dollar a gallon gas prices. They don't want to waste $2 a gallon driving from those places to places to not find it. Luckily, when eBay came around in 99, and before that, the user net groups, and before that, the toy magazine that used to have delivered to you, you could just go on there, and guess what? It's a $5 figure for $10 plus 2 $3 shipping. I could have it delivered to my door. They don't have the thrill of the hunt like me and several of you guys, I'm sure, have. So for them, it's uh, that $7 inconvenience fee. These are people who pay a $5 inconvenience, uh, convenience fee to buy a ticket for a ball game. You think a $5 convenience fee for buying an action figure is any different? Yeah, but the, the problem with that now, Dennis, is unfortunately, I mean, that's great, but it's you're not seeing $5. You're seeing these exorbitant prices. And, and, I mean, I mean, I, I know you've seen it, and once again, I've been to the store, and the guys have it. I've seen your prices. They're fair for what they are. You know, whether it's in my budget or not is another story. But, I mean, I mean, you've seen it out there now. I mean, it's gone crazy. And not only that, I mean, you just talked about the guys that, you know, will go on eBay and don't have the time to work. You know, or and you're assuming that they're let's assume that they're they're making high end bucks, but for for like Joe Average like myself, or I have some lead time and you know Junior, uh, to you know it's not 
a huge deal. It's a deal, but to go to the store and look, and the frustration of going, God damn it, someone cleared all this out. You know, I'm on my day off. I don't have the money, for example. Once again, we're, we're talking about unreasonable prices. I mean, for five bucks, yeah. I'm not seeing that so much anymore. You're, you're talking like, like a perfect example I could set out here is <clears throat> the current line of Ninja Turtles. Junior knows I obsessively looked for April and Crane for months and months and months. And it came down to a point where I was getting tired of looking for it because I didn't think we'd ever see reproductions of those. And I turned to eBay. Crane, not so bad. Maybe double the price. April, 45 55 60 dollars. That's insane. Now, luckily, I sat back and just waited, and I found him at Toys R Us paid nine dollars piece. But it's it's things like that. It's just ridiculous that right. and, and the, someone's and went in there and took everything off the shelf and thrown it on eBay. It, it, and, it, it and, annoys me. And not and not only that, but I mean, the problem is it's it's a it's a, I, I don't know the, the correct term, but it's a cycle that repeats. So, for example, if you do want to wait, and like I said, maybe you're seeing this, maybe you're not, Dennis. But if you do decide to wait it out, I don't think they even you can even do that anymore. I think what happens is you decide, okay, I'm going to wait it out. Then they make they manufacture more. Then the scalpers come in and they just wipe those out. So you can't even wait it out anymore. And then the next thing you know, the, you know, the, the geniuses at Hasbro, rather than figuring, hey, we're selling these things, uh, decide to stop the line, and then the prices start up. So, so it, 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 it's a vicious cycle, man. Well, let me tell you a cycle that actually kind of bit a bunch of the scalpers in the ass, and it's one of those dumpy fingers you have to put in the dike at one time, guys. Right. The Thundercats, when that stuff, everybody was gobbling up, I forget which two figures it was, Chikara and Tiger, I think. Oh, see, I would have thought now. it was Phantom Menace, man. Wait, from the from the latest Thundercats figures from about a year? The latest Thundercats. The latest Thundercats. Yeah. It was uh, the Twins. The Twins, okay. Wiley Kid, Wiley Cat? Yep. Well, the situation was, I remember people were coming into my store and asking me, guys, this stuff is so mass produced, just wait. And I'm seeing all this stuff hanging on shelves, and I'm like, just wait. The scalpers are gobbling up these one or two figures, it's not a huge issue, just wait. So, at that point, they had tons of their stuff on pallets and pallet containers. That stuff flooded big lots and all these secondary stores that are now popping up, Ollie's, big lots. I can't, even, I can't even name all of them. But all of a sudden, this huge flood of all the rare figures hit at once. I don't know if you know exactly what I'm talking about. I do. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, no guess idea. what? All the scalpers went out and found out, you know, the internet helps scalpers as much as it helps collectors. They went out and they tried to gobble up every single bit. Well, they all put themselves in the near bankruptcy situation. Because you couldn't buy all of that. And at the point at which nobody was willing to pay the 40 or 60 bucks a piece for those, I think that they're hitting at the high point. Yeah. Now you've got a supply of a thousand of them on eBay, all at 60. The buyers just were not going to buy it. Because they knew they were hitting Ollie's and, and Big Lots and you know, all these poor up places. So they were waiting. If somebody has a computer, look it up now. What are those figures going for now? No, you can still find them at, like, Toys R Us for fucking seven, eight bucks. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, the scalpers all took a bath on that. Yeah. See, now... So, patients will almost always... And, you know, like, I say this all the time about San Diego Comic-Con exclusives. Oh, oh now, you, now, now you really hit a, a bad spot there. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'll get, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> now there's an entire wave of scalpers to discuss me, so, you know, you know, I'll be on your side for that one. <laughs> now, Dennis... At what point were when you first heard the term scalper, did some did did you look at it as a negative thing? You know, when somebody says, "You know what, you're a scalper," and they looked at you and they said it probably with a negative tone. Did you take offense to it? Did you just kind of be like, "You know what, this is how I make my bread and butter. I don't feel offended." I mean, how did that get you when you first heard the term? Uh, you know, I'll tell you what. I first took a step back, but then I had purchased tickets from a ticket scalper, and I, I forget what concert it was too. And we know the really big concert that came out in like 92, I want to say. I can't remember which one it was. I, I, I used to go to a lot of concerts back then. We were the floor though. Price for the ticket. What? I said we were able to afford them back then, Dennis. <laughs> well, no, but yeah, you know, but no, they were still like 25 bucks a piece if you. But the thing was is this this concert was so jam packed. You had to call Ticketmaster. At a certain time, the yep. whole night were busy for two hours, and when you finally got through, all the tickets were sold out. I can't remember which one it was. 
Could have been anything. Like Genuine Lake Two. <laughs> Sounds like Metallica touring. I was gonna say it, it could it could have been anything at that point. It could have been Metallica. Who was Metallica touring with that? Uh, I believe they were touring with uh, Danzing and Suicidal Tendencies. Suicidal Tendencies, that's it. It was the Suicidal Tendencies because I was starting to get into them big. Okay, so, but you couldn't get the tickets. And they were sold out by the time you did get through. I was happy to pay $40 a piece for those tickets. They wasted two hours of my time, even at minimum wage, that's $10. I wasted $10 sitting there trying to get a ticket for 25 bucks. The pain this guy... 40 bucks, I gave you 5 bucks to not waste 2 of my hours. But, okay, but so, if I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, so now you're, you're talking, well, I mean $40, okay, from 25 Now, if it would have been $100, would you have done it? Would you have, or would you have been pissed that you couldn't get tickets and the only guys offering the tickets were at 100 bucks? And I think the cop that was really good, but it wasn't worth $100. Okay. <laughs> but it depends, you know, I mean, if you, if you missed the one concert, you know, where something really awesome happened and you found out about it afterwards, would it have been worth $100? I don't know. So, back to the question, though, like, when you first heard the, the term, well, you were labeled as a scalper. How did, how did that uh, make you feel? Yeah, well, I took a step back, and then I'm like, you know what? Scalpers are right at service. Yeah, I'm the kind of scumbags. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know what? They provide a service because I don't want to sit on the phone for two hours. Same thing with toys. At that point, my partner and I, we were driving around, but we'd probably waste three, four hours driving around looking for toys. This was when the toy bed stuff was hitting, the toy bed uh, marble stuff, and you couldn't find certain package variations or recolors. Yeah, about 92. Yeah, 92-ish, 93-ish. Yeah. And, and we're sitting there, you couldn't find, you, you could find storms all day long. Well, who wanted storm? Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, so, you know, and this was, those figures were crap. You know, in hindsight, you know, that would be like, you know, Buying just a just a Bieber ticket, and we had to drive around for those. <laughs> you know, totally. So you know, and at the point at which you know, a scalper when you when you put it in your mind like I did, the scalper provides a service and charges a fee for that service. And other people, and enough people do consider it a convenience. Now, the one thing we haven't talked about is the collector's market really infringes on. The real market of toys, which is kids. Right. Now, all of these collectors running around, gobbling up everything for their personal collections, or their buddy's personal collection and theirs, or one to open and one to keep in the package, whatever your particular collecting style is, you should see you Junior's face. product away from the kids who absolutely have their parents by the balls. <clears throat> they have 24 hours in a day to nag the parents for whatever the toy is. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have kids. I got two of them. Yeah, I got I one. Bought more, I bought more Skylanders at double price on Amazon and eBay than I care to remember, but I look at it as kind of my parents as the albatross I wear around my neck. <laughs> because now they are nagging me for toys. The same as my customers' kids were nagging them for toys. It's funny. So 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 once again, Dennis, I still have to have to ask. At bottom line, though, doesn't it piss you off though that you just can't go into a store and just get it yourself? I mean, for, it would, I mean, obviously you can afford the double. But for, for example, once again, when it starts getting to triple or ridiculous prices, don't you want to just sit there, you know, and go, okay, there's got to be a line here, or you know what, this is just ridiculous. I should have a opportunity as much as anybody else to go into a store and pick something off the shelf. I work just as hard, etc., etc. I don't mean to belabor the point. True. But, no, absolutely. But, and you're absolutely right. And here's where the situation arises from. Manny Collector. Manny Collector has figured this out, but they haven't. They're still trying to play these fucking games. Pardon my French. Mm. They, they release a figure for a short period of time. They order as many as you want, guys. Order as many as you want, because once this is gone, it's gone. And then they order them, the dealers order them, Brian's Toys orders them, Entertainment Earth orders them, because they have them on their site immediately at a marked up price. You know what I'm saying? Yep. But every collector has the ability to go on that website. But here's where the profit happens. There are so many people who do not want to pay Matty Collector six months in advance for a figure that might get canceled, might take nine months, might take six. They are willing to pay 40 to have it in their hands the second they see it available 
Can you describe what Maddie is? Because I had that guy just explain it to me. Anyone listening is probably not going to know what this is and what you're referring to. Okay. Mattel, correct? Maddie is Mattel. Mattel, yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Maddie was a little character on the boxes of the original 1960s and I think 50s, late 50s, all through the 60s. They had this little guy with a crown, and that's Maddie. Mattel mascot. So when they, you know, branded this character, when they branded this new collector's line, that's what they branded was this Maddie guy. Well, I learned something. Yeah, I, I had no idea. John speaks. <laughs> yeah. right. so, so, so what? So what you're saying is that there is a site. If someone wanted to order a figure, they could order it there. But most people won't wait for it, or the figure may be canceled. Well, yeah, some of them have they been canceled. So I, I, I'm not throwing that into the bus on that. But then you know, they'll say, okay, guy, it's a man club. You can buy a subscription. You're automatically guaranteed to be one of these figures. Uh, you have to call it at noon on this time to get this other figure. They set up a structure, I would say it's probably about 75%, you know, a successful promotion. <laughs> Take another instance, I think it's called Fun Publication, the Star Wars, or the G.I. Joe, and the Transformers Convention. Okay, yeah. These guys, and I think they're based somewhere out of Ohio, um, and these guys put on these great G.I. Joe and Transformers conventions. They have a coaches club for G.I. Joe. All right. It gives them, I think it's Dennis. Dennis, Dennis, we're going to have to put you on hold for a second because we're out of time for this episode. All right. But we will be back, ladies and gentlemen, our listeners. We'll be back next week with part two. You guys tune in, finish listening to Dennis and uh, the rest of us as we explain the toy uh, scalping. The toy scalping. <laughs> and the, the bad and the fugly. Yeah, the general collecting. So that's issue 14 for the Spinner Rack. Check us out at comicsremix.com and join us next time for part two of Toy Scalping, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm Junior. I'm Big B. I'm John. Carry the camera guy. And our special guest on the phone? That'd be you, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis Carter from Wonderworld Comics, and I also put on the Detroit Fan Fair Comic Con. And where are you located, Dennis? We're in Taylor, Michigan, on uh, Nico Square, two blocks east of Telegraph. All right, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for listening. Peace. Peace.